Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Nikolai Antov, uh, Associate Professor in the Department of History and also a member of the Middle East Studies Program and the King Fach Center uh, for uh, Middle East Studies. And probably most relevantly with respect to this lecture, uh, I'm the Director of the Religious Studies Program at the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Arkansas. And today it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor John Curry of the History Department of the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, who will uh, present a lecture entitled The Formation and Contemporary Prospects of Islamic Mysticism. The lecture is uh, organized and co-sponsored by uh, the Religious Studies Program and the King Fax Center for Middle East Studies. Uh, allow me to say a couple of words of, uh, about Professor Curry. Um, he has developed strong interest uh, in Islamic history and Islamic mysticism during the past uh, 25 years or so, or a quarter of a century, and uh, his research and publications on Islamic mysticism have made him one of the uh, prominent experts uh, on, on this issue in this field in the United States. Uh, he started developing his uh, interest in Islamic history and Islam uh, right after he finished his BA in North, at Northwestern University in 1992. He spent the 1992-1993 uh, academic year as a Fulbright student in Cairo in Egypt and later came to the Ohio State University uh, in Columbus, Ohio to complete a dual MA degree in uh, Arabic and history. Uh, and uh, later he spent several years of research uh, in Turkey, especially in manuscript libraries and archives, and completed his dissertation on um, early modern Ottoman uh, religious history uh, in 2005 at the Ohio State University. Later he published his first book, uh, which was, I believe, based on his dissertation or very much a, an expansion of his dissertation. His first book uh, was entitled The Transformation of Muslim Mystical Thought in the Ottoman Empire, The Rise of the Helvetic Order, 1350 to 1650, and it was published by Edinburgh University Press in 2010 to strong reviews. And later, uh, he also published uh, an edited volume, an important edited volume uh, of 12 articles on aspects of Islamic mysticism which he co-edited with Eric Olander, and that edited volume is, uh, it was titled Sufism and Society Arrangements on the Mystical uh, in the Muslim World 1200 to 1800, published by Routledge in 2012. Uh, apart from uh, Islamic mysticism, um, Dr. Curry has also developed other interests, especially in early modern Ottoman geography. Uh, so without much further ado, I'll uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Curry. Uh, thank you, uh, Nikolai, for that uh, uh, pleasant uh, introduction of, uh, uh, and reminding me that I've been at this for uh, nearly a quarter century. Uh, it's probably the first time anyone's ever noted to, that. To, I, it just yeah. occurred to me. It's been a while, hasn't it? Um, but uh, thanks to everybody uh, for coming, and uh, I'll uh, go ahead and uh, try and launch the uh, uh, the slideshow here. Uh, if you uh, give me a minute uh, uh, at the moment, uh, uh, let me uh, see if I can um, uh, pull it up. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, hopefully now um, everybody can uh, see the uh, slideshow as it was uh, intended. Um, so one of the things that I discovered when uh, trying to put this together is that uh, it's, it's one of the hardest kinds of lectures to give uh, for the simple reason uh, that uh, people often spend a lifetime trying to master the intricacies of uh, Islamic mysticism um, and uh, still did not succeed. So 
uh, what chance am I going to have at explaining it um, in an hour or less? Uh, and uh, uh, this is always one of the challenges that we face. So I'm going to try and provide a, a basic set of insights by first uh, bringing in some aspects of the contemporary present and then sort of explaining how Islamic mysticism formed during the early centuries um, of Islam as a religious tradition. Um, and then uh, conclude by maybe returning to the contemporary present and the uh, intersections of Sufism that are growing within the North American uh, context. Um, it will probably be a sort of very bare bones approach um, to the topic, but I'll try to sort Sort of outline some of the basic um, uh, issues uh, that one has to understand in order to sort of get a better sense of uh, Muslim mysticism. Um, and so to uh, start with, um, I'll bring in a recent event um, that occurred in, in about a decade ago. Um, that was uh, called the, the Park 51 or the Cordoba House controversy. And the Park 51 project um, was sort of a Muslim interfaith um, ecumenical center that was planned in New York City um, in a building that was a few blocks away from the uh, World Trade Center that had been destroyed during the attacks of 9-11. And uh, it uh, was immediately opposed when it became known by various uh, uh, politicians who basically viewed setting up some sort of uh, Muslim institution within close proximity of the World Trade Center as uh, uh, being sort of an insult to the memory of the people who died there, um, even though some of those people actually had been Muslim who had died in the attacks. Um, and it raised all kinds of questions about the degree to which Islamophobia um, had taken hold in American public life. Um, and there was a lot of debate uh, about uh, uh, what the, the proper outcome of this uh, process should be. And in the long run, the project uh, eventually uh, was, was canceled. Um, but what many people did not recognize at the time is that one of the primary backers of the project, uh, a man named Faisal Abdul Rauf, um, was in fact a, uh, uh, an immigrant to the United States who had come in the 1960s, and he had strong connections to uh, Islamic mysticism. Um, he was a part of a Sufi network uh, known as the Halveti Jirahi uh, Sufi Order. Uh, and uh, this uh, was sort of a, a, a recognized part of his uh, 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 worldview and the way in which he approached uh, things. And so many people sort of didn't recognize this uh, Sufi component um, in the whole uh, uh, framework. Uh, it was all sort of presented just simply as uh, Islam rather than as um, uh, a, a specific uh, vision. Uh, of Islam. And if anyone had delved more deeply into the background of the people who were uh, trying to implement this project, um, they would have realized that as Sufis, um, they would have had uh, no real uh, common ground uh, with the, uh, 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 the people who had launched the attacks and in fact would have been likely targets of the same people themselves. Um, so it sort of represented a kind of missed opportunity um, uh, for a sort of constructive dialogue in the minds of many who observed it at the time. Now, this being said, a, a second preface to the talk, um, we move from the United States to uh, the country of Turkey. Um, and this, what you see here is an example of a sign that's often placed outside of uh, uh, the tombs of pious figures um, in various re religious sites around Turkey. 
And I've translated basically what the sign says um, here on the left. Um, uh, it says, you know, basically to the attention of the visitors uh, of uh, these tombs and graves, uh, you know, according to our religion, you don't do the following things. Um, you don't make vows at the tomb. You don't sacrifice an animal. You don't light candles, don't tie strips of fabric, et cetera, et cetera. You can kind of read down the list here. Um, and at the end, it says these are clearly innovations and superstitions, and they're forbidden uh, in our religion. And so the question, therefore, has to be raised, uh, what is the purpose of these kinds of signs? Why does the uh, relig Ministry of Religious Affairs want to put these up? Um, and the answer is, is that these have, in a historic sense, been traditional practices. Um, of people following various kinds of uh, mysticism uh, in Turkey. Um, and uh, in the 20th century, uh, when Mustafa Kemal Ataturk uh, basically abolished the caliphate and the Ottoman Empire and placed Turkey in the framework of a secular republic, um, these reforms basically uh, uh, barred uh, mysticism from continuing to uh, practice and drove the Sufi orders underground and reorganized things like the Ministry of Religious Affairs uh, to basically conform with Enlightenment style thought, which uh, is often very hostile to things like superstition and traditions that don't seem to make sense in the minds of the enlightened, um, et cetera. Uh, these reforms demanded uh, a reform of dress as well, that you could no longer dress like a traditional Sufi, that you had to wear more Western style clothes and hats, et cetera. Um, and it sort of also dovetails uh, within a broader Muslim context in the early 20th century world of a modernizing set of Muslim movements um, that sought to sort of portray Sufism and mysticism as backwards or sort of a product of a bygone era. And that even if you were a devout Muslim and not a secularist like the founder of the Turkish Republic, um, you needed to do away with these things. So the mystics were getting it from both sides, both from secularizing reformers and religious reformers of a more puritanical nature, um, such as the Wahhabi movement um, in what today would be Saudi Arabia. Uh, so the basic framework here is that superstitious and innovative practices were viewed as clashing with modernity for much of the 20th century. Um, and even uh, very uh, well-informed scholars of Islam like Fazlur Rahman, uh, who uh, wrote uh, very important books about Islam and Islamic history and doctrine, um, or were often quite hostile to Sufism um, in the way that they uh, portrayed it and sort of portrayed it as anti-modern in a lot of ways. Um, the impact of globalization and the internet now means that these views um, can often be widely spread as well. And so the debate has moved beyond just people writing books uh, to people putting up websites willy-nilly. Um, you know, Sufism is good or Sufism is anti-modern and bad. And so uh, this now has sort of become, you know, globalized and much more widespread as a debate than it would have been in earlier times. So at this point, it's probably important to ask, well, what is this and, and where does it come from? Uh, what is the foundation for it? And in fact, you know, the best answer to the question is, is that it's, it's not exactly clear uh, because the very earliest phases of Islamic history um, often do not have a lot of contemporary sources that we can use to sort of assess exactly when what we might call an Islamic mysticism sprung into being. Um, but Sufis themselves would point to the text of the Quran itself, which is the foundational uh, Muslim holy book, uh, the revelation from God or Allah himself, um, as pointing in the direction of a mystical interpretation. 
Uh, the verse we see here is among the most famous, um, known as the Quranic chapter of, uh, 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 of the light verse, um, in which, uh, as you can sort of see from the translation here, uh, God is described as light upon light, um, as uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, incredibly powerful force. Um, so this is one way in which a mystical interpretation could clearly grow out of such a verse. Um, there's also a famous verse in which uh, God is described as being closer to every person of his creation uh, than the jugular vein um, in his neck, um, which could also uh, be uh, interpreted as having a powerful mystical symbolism. If God is that close to you, uh, you must want to gain a better understanding um, of him. Yeah. John, can um, I just ask you to start changing the slides? The slides don't change, sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, hmm. I'm not sure why that would happen. Uh, we still, all of us are still on the first slide. Uh, it looks okay. like... Okay. Yeah, it's probably because I put some animations in here, um, and uh, for some reason the animations are uh, not uh, going through. Uh, hmm. I, I'm not sure is the animation, is, is, are you sharing the screen with all of us? Yes, yes, okay. but I, I'm looking at it, and when I change the animation, uh, it does not um, uh, move to the next picture. Um, so uh, let me stop the uh, thing here. Yeah. And uh, okay, now we're seeing different, different, uh, uh, a different slide. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if I move them to the front, uh, it'll be awkward for the moment, but uh, uh, we should be able to uh, do it now. Uh, so okay, this is the one that I probably wanted to show. You should be able to see yeah. this now. Yes, we see uh, now origins of mysticism in the Islamic mm -hmm. context. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, this is the jugular vein verse that I was just uh, talking about um, that uh, uh, can also be sort of interpreted um, in, in that light. Um, and then finally, uh, there's another uh, uh, famous uh, verse here known as the uh, verse of the precise versus the unclear uh, or allegorical um, verses, um, which is a famous uh, uh, Quranic uh, 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 verse that uh, basically says that some things in the Quran are crystal clear and everyone's going to understand them. Other things are allegorical or require further kinds of interpretation um, that might be tricky and people are going to get it wrong. And this sort of further points the way um, towards a, a kind of potentially uh, mystical uh, interpretation um, in this regard. Um, uh, this all being said, uh, with the Quran as the foundation, um, we know that uh, there were various explanations given by later generations of mystics when they began to sort of set down their history um, in the 9th and 10th century, um, that there were various origins for uh, the whole idea of Sufism. And one was that the first mystics wore sort of very coarse wool cloaks as a way of sort of announcing their renunciation of worldly things. And since a wool, wool the word for wool was uh, Suf in Arabic, um, they came to be called Sufis, um, the people who wore the wool cloaks. Um, other people suggested that a group of uh, people devoted to the prophet Muhammad uh, used to sit on a veranda outside of uh, his uh, uh, home and mosque uh, and would just sort of jump up to serve the prophet whenever he needed something. And their dedication led them to be called the uh, people of the veranda or the bench outside of uh, uh, Muhammad's home. And in Arabic, this was the Ahl Sufa, um, therefore giving the name of Sufis um, as a model of prophetic dedication. Um, others pointed to a word uh, safa uh, in Arabic that means purity, thereby associating mysticism with purity. 
Um, but none of this can really be directly corroborated with anything from the earliest manifestations of Sufism. And the first sort of real historical uh, sources we have that sort of point to the emergence of what we might call mystics um, is uh, people who were uh, espousing asceticism um, and uh, reacted against the worldliness of their time. Um, some were uh, reciters of the Quran who always recited the Quran all the time above all else. Others constantly went around weeping for their sins and fearing for their salvation from God. And uh, interestingly, a book was just released yesterday um, by a guy named Bradley Bowman um, at the University of Louisville that actually argues that the first generation of Muslim mystics um, was actually uh, uh, often spending time with Christian monastics, um, people uh, uh, living in monasteries in the region, and that there was an interplay between these two groups in the foundational generations. I've not had a chance to read the book yet, it just came out, but it raises um, some interesting uh, possibilities. Um, at this point, we have to ask, well, what is going on with the form, form, formative years of Islamic civilization uh, at this point uh, that these people are starting to emerge into? And here we have to recognize that there's tensions um, in the early Muslim community. Um, after the prophet's death um, in the year 632, um, the uh, Arab Muslim community uh, rapidly expanded into the surrounding territories of the Byzantine and the Sassanid empires of Persia. And uh, within a generation, they had overran many of these formerly Christian or Zoroastrian lands um, and uh, simply uh, taken uh, them over, in some cases without even much of a fight in, in some areas. Uh, furthermore, uh, there were tensions within the family of the prophet. Uh, when the prophet died, um, one of his uh, relatives um, uh, was uh, uh, a man named Abu Bakr, who was eventually sort of made the uh, successor or the caliph um, to the prophet. Uh, but some people believe that the prophet's son-in-law, who had married his eldest daughter, Fatima, should have been caliph. Um, and there were tensions over who should be the rightful ruler after the prophet. And so there were tensions over who should govern and uh, who should be the caliph. There were also many different tribal and clan groups among the Arabs who had emerged as the foundation of the Muslim community. Um, and not of all of them saw eye to eye or settled in the same kind of places. Um, and those tensions were part of the equation as well. And in fact, by the year 661, when uh, the prophet's son-in-law Ali had been named uh, the caliph, uh, there was uh, uh, a civil war that broke out between various factions that eventually ended up with Ali's deposition and assassination. And uh, the uh, caliphate was taken over by a group known as the Umayyad Caliphs who many of the original pious Muslim community uh, didn't trust because they had been latecomers to Islam and some of their early generations had even fought against the Muslim community. Um, the reality of all of this was that in the Muslim world of the first century, uh, Muslims were a minority everywhere except really for the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, the lands that they overran and conquered, they were probably no more than 5% of the overall population. And the rest of the people over whom they ruled um, were often members of other religious traditions, um, from Christianity uh, to Zoroastrianism to Judaism uh, to various offshoot sects um, of uh, uh, varieties that dated from the time of the uh, Roman Empire. Um, and uh, so we have to understand the emergence of the early ascetic and weeping movement out of this Umayyad context. 
um, in which the Umayyads were viewed as too worldly and sufficiently uh, committed to religious uh, issues. And so we can see it in some ways as kind of a protest um, against uh, the problems of the early community because the conquests had brought uh, great wealth and power to the caliphs, uh, but at the expense often of uh, Muslim unity. Um, and so some viewed this as the development of an increasingly sinful community that was in need of reform. And in fact, by the year 750, a movement emerged to overthrow the uh, Umayyad caliphs, uh, known as the Abbasid uh, Rebellion. And uh, this, uh, in and of itself, uh, proved to be kind of a watershed moment because it sort of opened up a further Pandora's box of tensions among different factions in the Muslim community, um, all of whom felt that the Abbasid rebellion should make them the ones who should be the rulers. Uh, but in the end, a certain faction within the Abbasid family became the caliphs, and everybody else was uh, sort of uh, uh, forced to sort of follow that uh, uh, rule. Um, so the mystics can sort of be seen to some extent um, as uh, a reaction against this kind of uh, 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 tough politics um, of the time. In addition, however, once the Abbasids had taken control and the political situation had stabilized uh, somewhat in the wake of that event, uh, new emphasis came to be drawn from the Quran that transformed Islamic mysticism from just sort of a God-fearing, pious movement, fearful of uh, uh, the sins of the community, uh, to one who should put their focus on the love of God um, instead. And the classic verse that's often cited is the one we see here, um, Quran uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 54, um, in which uh, God is portrayed as someone who loves his community and who his community loves him. And drawing on this verse, um, uh, mystics increasingly began to broaden out the definition away from just simple asceticism and God-fearing behavior uh, to trying to establish a deeper love and connection with God. And this probably also mirrors the move away from the early roots of the Arab Muslim community to a more urban-centered civilization on cities like Baghdad and other places in Iraq and elsewhere, and uh, shift in sort of the cultural direction away from sort of the more austere world of the uh, desert of the early uh, Arab tribal groups. Um, now, one of the most important people um, who founded this doctrine of God's love um, is the figure of Rabi al um, who's very important in part because she is sort of the one female mystic who is uh, very well attested um, in Islamic history. And she has to be given credit for introducing this concept of love um, into uh, Islamic mysticism. And uh, one of the things uh, she did uh, was to sort of challenge the idea that just simply being God-fearing or worrying about one's own salvation um, was really the point of Islamic religion. And she read, she had a famous uh, 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 poem that I tried to, to read here. Um, o Lord, if I worship you because of fear of hell, then burn me in hell. If I worship you because I desire paradise, then exclude me from paradise. But if I worship you for yourself alone, then deny me not your eternal beauty. And so this, in a nutshell, sort of encapsulates the kind of philosophy um, that Rabia brought to uh, uh, what mysticism was supposed to be. Um, and it proved to be a dramatic turning point. Um, and subsequent generations of mystics all sort of followed the lead of her and others who were uh, describing these kinds of uh, issues moving forward. Uh, another concept began to emerge as well um, in the wake of Rabia's uh, intervention. Um, the idea that there were what was called friends of God 
um, or the awliya um, in uh, plural Arabic. Um, and these friends of God are mentioned in the Quran, uh, chapter 10, verse 62. And people interpret this to sort of mean people who could act as sort of uh, go-betweens or intermediaries uh, between uh, uh, God and uh, his community. Uh, and uh, some have uh, chosen to translate this as uh, saints, um, sort of borrowing from a sort of uh, Christian uh, word. But uh, that's not really how Muslims, you know, would translate it. They view them sort of as friends of God or those who act as protectors of the community or something uh, along uh, these lines. Uh, from this point forward, the mystical tradition becomes better and better attested, and we get more and more writings about them. Um, uh, a figure known as Dhulm Nunisri um, introduced a sort of framework of spiritual knowledge um, as part of mysticism. And he argued that every mystic has to sort of pass through a series of stages, uh, starting in the beginning uh, with what he called the Sharia, or the basics of Islamic law and doing the basics of uh, Islamic practice, uh, and then moving to what he called Tariqa, or the path of the mystic, um, adding on sort of additional secret practices that are taught to you by a, a knowledgeable person. And then moving to what he called Hakika, which is sort of understanding a higher truth uh, of uh, uh, that there's more beyond the visible world that you occupy. And then finally concluding with what he called marifa or spiritual knowledge um, that places you on a plane above the sort of material uh, world and sort of knowing and cognizant of uh, uh, God's higher being. And from this point forward, Sufis building on this began to create a kind of proliferation of various kinds of stages that seekers on the mystical path had to go through to try and reach a higher consciousness. And while the paths were many and multiple, um, the sort of basic framework founded in the ninth century sort of remained as, as the foundation. Um, a more problematic issue that arose was the question of whether Sufism should be drunken or sober. And the two major figures that are often sort of cited as being in opposition over this is uh, Bayezid al-Bistami, who was often noted for making what we call ecstatic utterances. Um, he would often sort of say things that seemed to conflate his own identity uh, with that of God himself, which is kind of a big no-no in Islamic theology. There's a, a distinct difference between man and God, and that's not supposed to be breached. Uh, but he would often say things that made it sound like he was somehow embedded within uh, divinity in some way. And uh, these uh, uh, sayings were often sort of very cryptic and difficult to interpret. And they contrasted with what was called the sober school of Sufism, led primarily by the key figure of Junaid al-Baghdadi, um, a, uh, uh, a famous mystic in Baghdad, um, who basically argued that uh, the mystic should not go around saying uh, things uh, in an ecstatic way. They should always maintain a sort of sober facade. And one's mystical experiences should uh, be uh, internal, um, and you should not go around just sort of spouting them off to anybody who's around you. And uh, Junaid is among a number of figures who came to be known as the Baghdad School, um, which is kind of a misleading term because there was no school involved. It was just sort of a, a loose collection of mystical teachers who all sort of built around these ideas of a sort of sober, God-fearing kind of mysticism um, that was uh, uh, not intended to sort of go beyond their own kind of circle of uh, well-informed uh, people. Uh, 
Now, an important thing to remember is that probably both Bayezid al-Bistami and Junaid al-Baghdadi uh, both downplayed the common folk um, in their teaching. Mysticism was supposed to be strictly for well-educated elites who had spent uh, a lifetime studying uh, uh, various aspects of mysticism and were well-versed in the Quran and the emerging traditions of the prophet Muhammad, and sometimes even uh, the emerging law schools um, as well at the time. And they tended to spread their ideas through informal teaching circles of, of early Sufi thinkers uh, who uh, basically would just gather together informally and sort of learn from each other and gain insights from each other. But they, just, they didn't usually just invite anybody in the door to sort of learn about this stuff. Um, they tended to keep it within uh, a spiritual elite. Um, this all changed with a, a figure that emerged about uh, the time of Junaid's, uh, the end of Junaid's life, a man named Mansur al-Halaj. Um, and Mansur al-Halaj was not in the same camp as people like Junaid uh, in a major way, and that was he was a popularizing Sufi. He went out and taught all kinds of people and he traveled around the Muslim world, sort of spreading his ideas. And he was more of a Sufi thinker in the ecstatic mode of Bayezid al-Bistami. Um, and uh, this sort of made Junaid uneasy um, in large part because the mystics had already been targeted in the ninth century by various religious leaders who viewed them suspiciously. And Mansur al-Halaj looked like a guy who was going to go around stirring up the pot and bringing all these people into mysticism who were not prepared to deal with it. And furthermore, by the time of Mansur al-Halaj, the Abbasid Caliphate had declined markedly and had been victim to various kinds of uprising led by messianic leaders, some, some of whom were of a, the Shia sect of Islam uh, and challenged the legitimacy of the uh, Sunni school that uh, the Abbasid Caliphs came to represent. Um, and uh, these rebellions had often decimated um, substantial parts of Abbasid Iraq um, during this time. And so eventually Mansur al-Halaj was arrested and sort of placed under arrest for a long period as people fought back and forth over whether he was one of these kinds of messianic rebels or if he was just simply a pious person who just sometimes uttered things in an ecstatic state um, that were controversial. Um, and eventually the case became politicized to the point where the Abbasid Caliph um, had him executed in a rather brutal fashion um, as a rebel and a, 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 as a rebel against the Abbasid state. Um, and uh, mystics often sort of uh, struggled at the time and for many centuries thereafter with Al-Halaj, who they viewed as a pious figure who exemplified uh, a lot of great mystical teaching, uh, but nevertheless uh, sort of maybe strayed too far into the dimension of uh, uh, behavior that uh, stirred up the pot a little too uh, much. And therefore future generations of mystics needed to take caution uh, from his uh, example uh, as a result. At this point, Sufism became increasingly prolific. Um, while Mansur may have been viewed skeptically by some mystics for his popularization of Sufism, it's probably no coincidence that by the latter half of the 10th century, we start seeing a proliferation of Sufi books and literature. And what this invariably tells us is that now there's a real audience for this stuff and everybody wants to know about it. And so people start producing works about prominent Sufi leaders and their teaching, handbooks about how to begin the mystical path and find a Sufi teacher uh, and things along this line. 
And one of the things that becomes clear from this rapid proliferation of Sufi literature is that it's tied to a great translation movement in uh, Abbasid and early Islamic civilization in which the various uh, philosophical and uh, uh, scientific texts of uh, classical Greek um, and uh, uh, from Persian and uh, even from Sanskrit and India were all translated very rapidly um, into Arabic. And the ideas from this uh, philosophical translation movement came to be embedded um, in Sufism uh, as well. And especially we can see the appropriation of what's called Neoplatonic uh, philosophy, um, uh, which is uh, uh, sort of does uh, something uh, that's very hard to explain, and I won't try and do it here. Um, but the basics of it is, is that uh, in the, uh, uh, around the uh, uh, 200s or so, uh, uh, a sort of classical Greek thinker named Plotinus uh, began working to sort of uh, try and reconcile the emerging doctrines of early Christianity, Judaism, and other sort of monotheistic type sects. Uh, with the classical philosophical work of uh, uh, thinkers like Plato and to a lesser extent, um, Aristotle. Uh, and uh, this Neoplatonic philosophy, the basis of it is, is that there is a sort of prime mover, which uh, later generations who followed Plotinus would uh, associate, of course, with God as the prime mover. Um, and then from the prime mover or God, various kinds of emanations of uh, uh, the world of the uh, intellect and various kinds of unseen worlds, and then eventually uh, human souls, and then the world of uh, human beings and matter, all sort of emanate out from God, sort of spilling over like water from a fountain. Um, and so, the way that mystics picked up on this is that they argued that the, the ultimate goal of mysticism is to sort of work your way back up this chain of emanations to sort of get as close to God, the prime mover, as possible. And if possible, to sort of annihilate your lower self, your carnal self, um, in, uh, in, in God and in the emanations of the divinity by understanding its manifestations. And uh, by doing so, then uh, creating a permanence known as baka or subsistence in the divinity um, that sort of gives you a new self so that you sort of shed away your old uh, corrupted self made up of sort of the matter and the lower elements of the Neoplatonic universe and uh, thereby become annihilated to gain this new identity. And the explosion of Sufi literature from the 10th century onwards sort of builds on this philosophical tradition. But it also creates what are called hagiographies or the sort of lives of pious people um, or Sufi leaders that you can then sort of use as exemplars to study the mystical path as well. And you begin to see these sort of catalogs of various kinds of mystical thinkers that are sort of great history for the period because you learn all kinds of narratives and things about these people through uh, the orally transmitted uh, uh, accounts about them. And these trends culminate in an important figure known as Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, um, who basically inherited a world where Sufism had developed these sort of philosophical underpinnings um, and uh, had become a sort of very popular element in the Muslim world. Uh, but it was also in tension with doctrinaire Islamic law who, as we saw in the case of Mansur al halaj uh, viewed these kinds of people with skepticism sometimes and worried about their orthodoxy. And al-Ghazali's major contribution was to harmonize together the teachings of Sufism uh, with the foundations of Islamic law. Uh, thereby making Islamic law the sort of key foundation 
from which to basically study mysticism. And he also sort of privileged Sufi mystics as the best exemplars uh, of the law in his famous revival of the religious sciences. And so from this point forward, Al-Ghazali gave the Sufis a certain respectability that had not sort of fully been established um, up to this point or that they had struggled to put into place. And from this point forward, by giving, uh, by a thinker like Al-Ghazali, who was read throughout the Islamic world, uh, basically giving his approval to Sufism, it allowed Sufism to spread far more rapidly and more fully uh, than ever uh, before. From this point forward, we begin to see the proliferation from the 1100s onwards of what are called the Sufi tariqas, um, or the paths, or they're sometimes called the Sufi orders. And these were all based on the charismatic leadership of a sort of great Sufi leader who then imparted his teachings to uh, other great Sufi leaders around him who then carried it into the next generation. And they created uh, various kinds of uh, chains of authority. And what we see here in the picture is uh, the, uh, uh, the great Suhrawardi um, uh, Lodge in Baghdad. Um, which had sort of been a center for one of the great uh, spreading orders known as the Suhruwardiya, um, which spread as far afield um, as India uh, and, uh, had, uh, and often gave a foundation uh, to um, other uh, 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 Sufi orders as well. Uh, this is an example of a Suhruwardi uh, lodge in India that we see uh, uh, here. Um, uh, Let's see here. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, okay. Let me just see if I can cut this out. Okay. And this, uh, what we see here is an example of what's called a uh, silsila um, or a, uh, a chain of authorities um, that goes back in theory to the prophet Muhammad and indeed God himself. And this is sort of drawn up like a double-bladed sword in the text that we have here. And it sort of is made up of all the names of all the Sufi leaders going back to the prophet and the early caliphs of Islam who had imparted the teachings down to the contemporary era. And then the two blades of the sword at the bottom represent, in this case, the branch of the order that spread into Egypt, and the other one, the branch of the order that spread into Istanbul um, in Turkey. Um, so you can sort of see how uh, Sufism created structures that thereby uh, made it institutionalized and sort of centered around key Sufi leaders who could then travel around the Muslim world establishing their own branches and sub-branches of various uh, paths within the uh, mystical tradition uh, that became sort of powerful local touchstones for Islam. And these people were often instrumental in sort of converting local populations to uh, the Muslim faith, sometimes in far flung places. And in other cases, taking populations who weren't that well informed about Islam, even though they were Muslims, and sort of giving them a stronger foundation um, in the faith. Um, this all being said, um, the development of mysticism sometimes sparked further controversy, despite Al-Ghazali's intervention. Um, and one of the most important figures that emerged was a man named Ibn al-Arabi, um, who came from Islamic Spain uh, and uh, uh, came to the central lands of the Islamic world and uh, who sort of took the Neoplatonic foundations and created a sort of vast synthesis of thousands and thousands of pages, sort of naming all of the prophetic figures um, in the Islamic tradition and sort of centering each of these prophetic figures as a facet of Muslim mysticism and sort of uh, 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 creating a kind of a, a, a superstructure um, that some Orthodox uh, Muslims found uh, problematic 
um, in its interpretation and in, in, in its uh, sort of uh, uh, potential violation of the distinction between God and man. Um, interestingly, this century of the early 13th century saw a lot of comparative mystical movements as well. In Christianity, the figure of Meister Eckhart um, sort of has a lot of similarities to the Neoplatonism of uh, 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 Muslim mystics like Ibn al-Arabi. And uh, in Judaism, in Cairo, figures like Moses Maimonides um, and his descendants um, were often sometimes referred to as Jewish forms of Sufis and also interacted with Muslim Sufi mystics in their own uh, accounts. Um, so there seems to have been a sort of broad sharing of this uh, kind of uh, uh, idea of mysticism among Jewish, Christian, and uh, uh, Muslim figures at this time, although they all located that mystical understanding in their own scriptural traditions um, uh, in some way, shape, or form. Um, the uh, Mongol invasions uh, of the 13th century upended much of this development. Um, and here I have a map that you hopefully can see that sort of uh, lays out um, the uh, extent to which the Mongol conquests uh, encompass large parts of the Muslim world and indeed in unified much of the Asian landmass as far as uh, China um, in, in this regard. Uh, so, uh, these uh, Mongol invasions were preceded by an influx of Turkic speaking peoples from Central Asia, starting with the Saljuks and others uh, from the 11th century onwards. And uh, these proved deeply disruptive to the traditional uh, Muslim institutions um, of their time. Uh, many Islamic theological schools and mosques were destroyed by the conquest. Many Muslim survivors had to flee from one part of the Muslim world to another. Uh, the, um, one of the most famous Islamic mystics, a man named Jalal ad Rumi, the founder of the Mevlevi order of the whirling dervishes, is an example of this. His family comes from Afghanistan, and when Afghanistan is overrun uh, by the Mongol invasions, his father uh, flees from Afghanistan and uh, settles in uh, what today would be southern Turkey um, at Konya. And uh, it's here that uh, Jalal al-Din Rumi begins to uh, uh, bring his own idea of mystical development to life. Um, and uh, so with the de decline of many traditional Islamic institutions, often these highly mobile Sufis and their tariqas, which were centered on the charismatic leadership um, of a, a sheikh or a peer, as they're sometimes called, uh, were often the major surviving carriers of Islamic teaching and doctrine. And so the post-Mongol era is often sort of viewed as a golden age of Sufism uh, because these orders simply become kind of the carriers of much of Muslim knowledge at the time and become the foundation stones for a broader Muslim community that begins to spread into new areas of the world that weren't previously uh, Muslim. And uh, Jalal al-Din Rumi's uh, works often demonstrate that he's part of a community uh, of not only Muslims, but also of Jews, uh, uh, Christians, and even sometimes Zoroastrians um, and, and others that are all sort of part of this broader uh, community. Um, and he also implements a series of practices that we today know as the sort of whirling of the uh, dervishes. Um, that sort of further cement Sufism as a public ceremonial practice um, that was uh, open to um, uh, sometimes anyone who wanted to uh, attend. Uh, people like Rumi, having come from Afghanistan, wrote most of their work in the language of Persian. Um, but we also have Turkic Sufi figures such as the uh, simple but yet very uh, profound poetry of Yunus Emre, um, who was sort of a, a wandering figure um, who 
placed uh, various kinds of uh, uh, simple poems that any sort of Turkic speaker could understand. And uh, his uh, literature and literary work often became the foundation for many later Turkish um, Sufi orders um, in their own right. So this is kind of you know, the point where Sufism really sort of takes off and proliferates in all different kinds of ways that are probably too difficult for us to sort of fully explicate here. And since uh, Nikolai had asked me not to sort of go into how incredibly complex this was, I'll leave you with only two thoughts, which was that in the sort of post-medieval period, three major empires of the Ottomans, the Safavids and the Mughals uh, emerged across much of the Islamic world. And in the Ottomans and the Mughals, these various Sufi tariqas spread rapidly and became sort of defining figures of the landscape um, that often uh, supported and intersected with the political leaders of their time. And in the case of the Safavid dynasty of Iran, the Safavids themselves were founded as an actual Sufi order, uh, the Safavid Sufi order, and their leader, Shah Ismail, was sort of viewed as the head of the religious order, as well as being a political leader. And this made them somewhat unique in the Muslim world. And in addition, they also had turned this Sufi order into an expositor of Shiite messianic doctrines um, in their own right. Um, so uh, Sufism was so deeply embedded in these uh, empires that it was probably impossible uh, to not encounter it. And some have estimated that upwards of 50% of the Muslim population in these empires would have had some connection to some form of Sufism uh, by the 18th and uh, 19th century. So let's uh, move towards a conclusion here. And I'll skip ahead to go back into the contemporary present. Um, in some cases, we can see by the 17th and 18th century that some Sufi groups came under attack by movements of a sort of puritanical nature. Uh, a famous one was in the Ottoman Empire, a group known as the Qadazadli movement targeted some Sufi practices and uh, leaders as being contrary to Muslim orthodoxy and sometimes even physically attacked them and demanded um, that they be uh, sort of uh, declared illegal um, in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and these movements towards a Muslim form of Puritanism, as uh, some have called it, although this is a controversial way to put it, um, we can see movements like the Wahhabi movement that emerges out of Arabia, which is often very austere, uh, very legalistic, and very anti-Sufi. Um, and in areas where the Wahhabis have taken over, um, the sort of former shrines and tombs uh, built to honor Muslim Sufi saints have often been uh, torn down um, and uh, various kinds of uh, devotional activity carried out at these locations has been forbidden. Uh, furthermore, by the 19th century, the sort of growth of European imperialism in large parts of the Muslim world led to a reaction of sometimes called Islamic modernism, um, which often encompassed declaring forms of traditional Islam and mysticism as superstition and not properly grounded in uh, proper Islamic teaching, as we saw earlier. But this sort of obscures the fact that the Sufi orders themselves um, sometimes had very different reactions to this growth of Western power. Uh, some of them proved very resistant, sometimes led actual physical movements of resistance against colonialism and imperialism. Um, others sort of became very modernist in their orientation. The Medlevi order in Istanbul, for instance, um, was often sometimes one of the greatest supporters of founding a secular republic. And that's often not well known because they were sort of erased from the historical record thereafter as a Sufi order. So some adapted quite well and sort of joined up with these modern ideas, whereas others resisted them significantly. So you can't paint them necessarily with a broad brush. 
So to conclude, Sufism in North America has actually been around for a very long time, believe it or not. And Faisal Abdul Rauf, um, uh, the person I started with this lecture, is only really one manifestation of it, a sort of educated immigrant um, who comes and sort of founds a kind of modernist form of Sufism. Um, in fact, the earliest Sufis who came to North America were enslaved Africans from the Muslim parts of Africa. Uh, a famous example is one Omar ibn Said, um, uh, who uh, came from Guinea in West Africa. And uh, I just found out actually that there's going to be an opera that's going to be performed in North Carolina, uh, or at least it was supposed to be uh, this year about him as a sort of famous figure in the uh, 19th century. And Omar ibn Said, um, uh, we know, actually was able to copy from memory, despite being a slave, um, a lot of mystical texts that have survived um, in uh, various kinds of archives in the United States today, some of them dating back as early as the 12th century. So often some of these captured slaves were educated Muslims um, who were from a mystical background and could actually produce mystical texts, uh, sometimes surreptitiously in the slavery context of the uh, pre-Civil War uh, United States. Um, in the 20th century, we begin to see um, changes as well. Uh, Hazrat Inayat Khan, although he's sort of more famously associated with the performance of music, uh, was a Indian Sufi himself. And furthermore, an American movement known as the Transcendentalists, as they began to get translations from Orientalist scholars of poets and mystics like Rumi and Hafez, uh, sometimes incorporated this into their own doctrines as a kind of universal religion. Um, so they're not Sufis per se, but they're certainly admiring and drawing on Sufism um, as part of this. Uh, an interesting example of North American Sufism is the Bawa Muhyiddin shrine outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. And Bawa Muhyiddin was a Sri Lankan uh, Muslim Sufi who migrated to the United States. And eventually his American followers uh, ended up sort of building a shrine to him uh, after his death in Pennsylvania. And interestingly, it now attracts huge numbers of South uh, 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 Indian subcontinent immigrants from all over the region who come and sort of perform their sort of traditional devotions from uh, South Asia um, at the shrine. And this often creates tensions with the original American followers who are kind of like, well, wait a minute, we thought this was supposed to be for what we were doing. And now we've got all these South Asians who are flocking to the shrine because it's a representation of our own culture. Um, furthermore, African Americans um, have become major conduits for Sufism. Um, Faisal Abdul Rauf is really probably not the major manifestation. It's really African American uh, forms of Muslim doctrine uh, linking into global Sufism, ranging from various African Sufi orders like the Muridiya of Senegal um, to um, other uh, noteworthy groups going back as early as the 1930s. And uh, even in Harlem today, there are West African sort of Sufi parades once a year to honor Sufi uh, saints that are major events there. Um, so this is just really a thumbnail sketch. I mean, there's a huge proliferation of various kinds of Sufi movements ranging from sort of traditional Sufi movements imported from abroad to those that sort of have a strong American transcendental flavor to them, um, to those that we might call uh, in the end, uh, you know, kind of new age forms of Sufism that kind of strip out some of the Islamic doctrine that's often deeply embedded within it to simply focus on sort of universal kinds of things. And uh, the question that I'll leave you with is whether you know, the future of Sufism is resurgence um, rather than gradually being sort of withered away um, as a, a kind of relic of a traditional past as many has presented it. 
Um, for one, there's been an explosion of global studies. When I started writing my book on the uh, Halvetti Sufi order that Nikolai mentioned uh, about the year 2000 or so, um, there was very little about the Sufi orders. Um, there was a couple of uh, Turkish books um, that were very useful to me, but mostly I just had to go on manuscripts. And now there's like entire journals that like discuss uh, Sufi studies. Um, there's all kinds of books all over the place, especially in uh, foreign languages. There are all kinds of scholars studying various kinds of Sufism around the world. Um, and this suggests that this has taken on an interest well uh, above and beyond what it had before. Uh, furthermore, and this is a more controversial element, uh, some governmental entities have sort of declared Sufis as kind of a potential political ally in the struggle against uh, global terrorist movements, uh, sort of presenting them as sort of more moderate Muslim figures um, who can win people over to a sort of anti-terrorist framework. Um, this is problematic, not least because not all Sufis sort of see things in this kind of a binary way um, and are sometimes uncomfortable with being co-opted into political projects um, uh, that don't necessarily seem to be aligned with their overall goals. Uh, but nevertheless, it does uh, sort of play a role in sort of the public discourse um, about that as the Park 51 incident at the beginning of the lecture pointed to. Uh, you may find it interesting that two of the 10 most popular selling poets in the United States are the Muslim mystics Rumi and Hafez uh, from the 13th and 14th century respectively. Um, and this is in part because they've been popularized by poets like Coleman Barks um, in Georgia. Um, all this has sparked controversy because Coleman Barks often sort of rephrases the poems in his own idiom and often strips away some of the sort of Muslim language and underpinning of the poems and gives them sort of a more universalist theo, where more doctrinaire Muslims are like, well, that's not exactly how Rumi put it. You know, you should you know, reproduce him accurately and faithfully. Um, and in fact, the two can sometimes be very different. Um, finally, and I'll leave you with this thought, there are some movements that are now trying to sort of fuse modern science and technology uh, with the teachings of Sufism to sort of create hybrids um, that can sort of reconcile the tension between the sort of frameworks of modernity and the traditional underpinnings of Sufism itself. And uh, uh, groups like the Gulen movement, which are very controversial in large part because of recent events in Turkey, um, would have been an example of this before they were proscribed in Turkey because of uh, tensions with the ruling party there. Um, and uh, you also see movements like the, uh, uh, the Center for Sufi Studies in India, which sort of has a Naqshbandi Sufi order underpinning, uh, but often sort of frames itself as being, you know, sort of a center for both traditional Sufi practices, but also for sort of scientific understanding. Um, so at this point, I think I probably overstayed my welcome a bit. Um, I, uh, I was hoping to try and keep this pared down, but it's difficult to do. And so I'll thank Nikolai for uh, having me and everybody else for uh, uh, coming in. And uh, I also always thank um, all the people who supported me over the years to do this kind of work. Um, so uh, I appreciate everybody being here and I'll pass the, the ball back to uh, Nikolai at this point uh, for questions or whatever he'd like to do. You gotta unmute. Unmute, okay. Thank you, John, for the very uh, insightful and comprehensive lecture. And at this point, I will welcome questions. Uh, we covered quite a bit of ground. And you can raise your hands. I mean, I'll try to see whether we have. Yeah, I can monitor the chat as well if I can get back into the uh, thing here. Uh, well, I guess that's a little trickier than I thought. I see a hand from one person here. Okay, let me, I mean, uh, whoever has the, I cannot see 
Uh, let's see. Uh, I cannot see the raised hand, but whoever. Okay, yes, so talk about it. yes. Um, uh, okay, uh, Professor Ken. Um, what do you mean by uh, resurgence of Sufism? Is it, is it in terms of its literary appeal in the West, such as uh, Hafiz or Rumi, or as an uh, ideological movement, uh, religious movement? What, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually a good question, um, and uh, in, in large part because I was uh, trying to sort of not go over time here, I uh, probably, you know, oversimplified things a great deal. Um, in some ways, I guess when I was putting that together, uh, you know, what I was thinking about was uh, that for much of the 20th century in places like Turkey, uh, Sufism had kind of been driven underground and uh, was only sort of allowed in the public sphere in very uh, limited cultural uh, fashion. Um, such as shows of whirling dervishes uh, of an ecumenical nature and things along this line. Uh, that's all changed now, and they've all sort of re-emerged and become, you know, uh, you know, uh, public figures and, uh, you know, people who are no longer sort of hiding in the shadows um, in this regard. Um, and, uh, you know, in other places, you know, the Sufism never really left. I mean, the Indian subcontinent, it's, it's, it's just simply so embedded in the cultural framework there um, that you, you probably wouldn't talk of a resurgence at all. Um, you know, it's simply always been there, um, and it's a, sort of a part of, uh, you know, local cultures um, all over the region. And in places like Egypt, um, you would have maybe seen, you know, some uh, declines in Sufi membership, you know, during the 1960s and 70s, um, uh, when uh, people sort of gravitated more towards Arab nationalism. Um, but uh, now these uh, figures have once again reemerged and become sort of important parts of the, of the, of the landscape. Um, so I was thinking of it more in the context of certain places where uh, Sufism had been eclipsed by political or ideological changes um, in uh, the framework of uh, politics and society. And as those uh, ideological movements and changes of the 20th century sort of uh, lost their appeal and vigor, it allowed a space for uh, Sufis and uh, Sufi movements to begin uh, reclaiming uh, more ground in addition to expanding their range to new parts of the world. Uh, such as in uh, North America, um, as I mentioned, and becoming sort of a, a, a truly uh, global phenomenon in a way where uh, some orders might have only been regional in a sort of pre-global era. Um, uh, hopefully that sort of uh, maybe clarifies it a bit. Other questions? Me... May I ask another supplementary okay. question? <laughs> Okay, uh, Professor Curry, uh, do you think it is spontaneous, the appeal of Sufism in contemporary period, spontaneous in terms of uh, uh, appeal to, uh, to the masses, and that's how it is becoming popular, or because it is getting uh, support from the ruling elites, say, as a alternative uh, uh, to mainstream or extremist type of uh, uh, Islam? Well, I mean, it, it, there's a little bit of, of both, I think. I mean, uh, you could really, uh, you know, find examples of both of those. And part of the difficulty here is, you know, if you try and paint Sufism with a broad brush, you're, you're invariably going to get something wrong uh, because uh, uh, they, it's, it's a very, you know, sort of, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of what we would call multiplicity. Um, you know, not all Sufis sort of look at things the same way or do things the same way. Um, if you sort of read the accounts of sort of uh, people who are attracted to Sufism in the contemporary era, 
Um, they often sort of present it as being a long drawn out journey where they sort of might encounter, you know, some sort of a Sufi figure very briefly, and it sort of makes an impression on them. But for many years, they're not really interested or paying much attention to Sufism per se, and only gradually do they sort of work their way back to this kind of figure and sort of gradually become immersed in the movement. And these figures, you, you read them and, you know, they're not talking talking about political you know, leadership or anything like this at all. If anything, they're just sort of talking about a certain dissatisfaction with the spiritualism of their own society. Um, so this is you know, sort of one possible manifestation you might have. Um, there also might be others you know, where you might find a, a prominent group of Sufi leaders within a certain order, such as the Naqshbandiya, um, who are often very close to politically influential figures um, and might uh, you know, perhaps be a conduit into politics for those who follow them. Uh, in some cases, um, in Turkey, there is you know some evidence for uh, this as well, and I suspect you could probably find um, uh, other examples elsewhere. Um, so uh, you know, it 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 really you know you you could say all different kinds of possibilities uh, abound here. Um, but uh, you know, my general sense is that for the ordinary person. Um, what Sufism delivers for them is some kind of spiritual meaning that was lacking before, uh, or that they find certain dissatisfaction in the sort of uh, traditional spiritualism uh, of whatever religion they start off with or in the society around them. They're just deeply dissatisfied in some way, and uh, they're drawn to it because of that. And I would add that even in the sort of traditional classical medieval descriptions of people coming into Sufism, you find a lot of the same things. You know, they sort of start out as sort of, you know, traditional ordinary Muslims of one kind or another, but they just gradually become dissatisfied with the sort of traditional paths or worship open to them and gradually just sort of gravitate instead to one of these mystical leaders because they offer them some sort of deeper meaning that they couldn't find on their own in their own framework. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any other questions? Let me see. If not, I will ask one quick question. Uh, you mentioned that the Mevlevis supported Atatürk's reforms. Mm -hmm. like, Some of them did, yes. Yeah. And this was what not was... something I knew until recently. I only okay. recently you, came across you know, this. Know anything on the rationale of the support? Um, it seems to be uh, that uh, you know they they were just sort of these modernizing type of reformers. I, I, I mean, for example, in the late Ottoman period. Um, a number of the Mevlevis were sort of put under surveillance by the Abdul Hamid II regime for sort of being a little too progressive and modernizing and, you know, sort of, you know, tied to these sort of more, you know, uh, Ittihad ve Taraki kind of mm -hmm. movements. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in the aftermath of World War I with the collapse of, uh, you know, Ottoman legitimacy, you know, these figures often gravitated instead to the sort of formation of a modern republic because they had plenty of beefs with the sort of former, you know, authoritarianism of the Abdul Hamid regime, and they were not particularly fond of uh, uh, the Ottomans. And obviously at the time, nobody sort of knew that Ataturk was going to abruptly jump up and abolish the caliphate and, uh, you know, uh, suppress the Sufi orders and things like this. And so you'll find books published, you know, at the end of the War of Independence in you know 22 and 23 by Mevlevi authors, you know, with sort of dedications to Ataturk and things uh, like this. Oh, this is um, so we always have to keep in mind that nobody knew Ataturk was going to take the radical secularist you know route that he did until he actually did it. 
Um, and uh, this kind of caught, I think, many people off guard. And, you know, some of these Mevlevi thinkers, you know, genuinely believed that moving to sort of a more modern kind of um, Republican style government, uh, you know, would be uh, the best path forward for, uh, you know, their own future, you know, be they Sufis or, or otherwise. So, um, you know, Sufis can come at this from very divergent perspectives. Um, not all of them were, you know, sort of, uh, you know, and, and I, I, an order that I'm working on right now, a, a book on right now, um, the Masuhi order, um, you know, they clearly embraced certain aspects of modernism. You know, they, uh, their founder tried to, you know, sort of publish at an extensive book, sort of creating a kind of foundation for the order that could thereby register it as an official part of the late Ottoman culture of the um, Ittihad, you know, the CUP movement and things like this. It was never finished because of the outbreak of the war, uh, but he was certainly moving in this direction to sort of, you know, frame his order as a sort of a modern contributor to the sort of new way of governing and doing things under the Committee of Union and Progress. So, um, you know, they, it, 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 it's always tricky. We can never quite, you know, put these people on the same box. You know, they, they all are, you know, individuals with their own individual approaches to mysticism and the, their social context and what have you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? Yeah, and I suppose people could just unmute, I guess, and ask yeah. if they would like. I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite okay with that. I'll ask, it looks like there aren't any questions at the time being. I'll ask one last question. Um, could you t tell us a little bit more about forms of expression, Sufi expression in modern Turkey beyond the Gulenists? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to, to some extent, uh, it's... Uh, I mean, the, there's really a variety of different things. I mean, uh, the Mevlevi order was even, you know, during the period of the highest secularism was sort of allowed to do various kinds of public performances and were viewed as a sort of a cultural exposition of Turkishness, if you will, um, you know, as much as, as a Sufi order. Um, so in some ways they never fully went away. Um, some branches of the Halveti order were sort of tacitly allowed to carry on rituals in much the same way that you could attend at their Teke in Western uh, Old Istanbul. Um, you know, so that, you know, was sort of tacitly allowed in the later periods as well. And um, I, I, what I sensed is that as the sort of old secular consensus uh, crumbled, by the end of the 20th century, um, what you sort of began to see is this abrupt resurgence of in interest in all things religious um, in Turkey. Um, and this could range from you know, a greater interest in the Ottoman Empire to a greater interest in jurisprudence um, to more people making the pilgrimage to Mecca and Medina, and also a proliferation of various kinds of Sufi texts. Um, one of the byproducts of, um, you know, this shift in Turkish culture uh, was the rise of multiple Din Bey Lahiyat faculties in universities uh, or religious studies uh, departments. Um, and often, you know, uh, reams of students would be sent out to sort of, you know, focus on a singular text and sort of produce a published copy of it that then would be sold in the bookstores and you could sort of read these various Sufi orders ranging from the most local and regional figures to some of the most um, important ones in the Muslim tradition. And so when I first started my research, you know, there weren't that many of these and by the time I finished it, I had all these translations at my back and call. Um, so what this suggests is there was a sort of this latent connection to Sufism below the surface, 
um, that then just sort of came rushing out afterwards. And, uh, you know, when I started, you know, becoming a recognized person who was working on this, you know, people would just sort of abruptly seek me out when they found out I was in Turkey, you know, and they'd say, yeah, well, my father was one of these people, you know, here's some of his, you know, books and ideas. Can you connect me a little better with, you know, what his spiritual antecedents were? And sometimes I could look at them and I'd know right away where they came from and, you know, who you could connect them to. And at other, other times, I was just kind of like, you know, emoji shrug. I, I'm not really sure, you know, uh, how to frame them. Um, they seem just sort of a local and regional pious figure. Um, but, you know, it sort of shows that people had this as part of their family legacy and lineage, and they were interested in recovering that. Uh, because it had kind of been lost and, you know, uh, taken away from them uh, by the sort of suppression of a lot of this during the Republican uh, period. And, uh, you know, even in my own family, I'm actually married to a uh, Turkish woman. Um, and even in our own family, I've had to go around translating their old Ottoman writings that they have in the personal family archive because they're just hand them to me and they're like, we can't read this. Can you read this? Because they changed the uh, alphabet in 1928 from an Arabic alphabet to a Latin alphabet. And so none of them can read the old you know, writings written in the Arabic script. I'm the only one in the family who can really make sense of them anymore because the people who used to know that have all passed on. And so I have to actually translate it back to them in modern Turkish so they can actually read their old family archival writings. Um, so, um, you know, I think this is sort of part of a broader process of cultural recovery as people want to go back now and sort of recover that part of their past um, that was uh, not considered important in earlier generations. And in some cases, you know, sort of tucked away in family archives and writings and uh, not really fully available to them until now. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if you don't mind, I want to make a comment about the popularity in contemporary era. Uh, is it okay, Nikolai? Yeah, uh, probably uh, uh, take... because we're a bit advanced with time, but anyway, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, minute or minute and a half. Dr. Kari, I pub edited a book which was published in 2019. It's called uh, The Cultural, Cultural Fusion of Sufi Islam. I basically work with popular type of Sufi tradition, mostly in Bangladesh, which uh, during my ethnographic study, which I observed that the, uh, Sufism becoming popular day by day. And I tried to figure out why. But what I noticed that one, uh, it, the mass people do not understand the intellectual appeal of uh, Serumi, uh, Jami, uh, or those big Sufi sheikhs of uh, early period. What they notice is that it is not that, uh, I mean, not that rigid. If you are a Sufi follower, you don't need to pray five times a day. The very popular crude type of appeal. Okay. Then you can, you can uh, uh, dance and sing. This is another appeal. Third thing is that government is becoming uh, uh, skewing towards, I mean, pristine or pure type of Islam. I mean, Sunni Islam formalities. Consequence is that they ban uh, popular public theater, a popular gathering, uh, uh, everything popular. So Sufi uh, uh, dargahs and shrines are a place of public gathering. Uh, uh, weekly, even weekly public gathering or yearly uros, it, it, it is open. Government cannot do anything. So those are the type of practical social thing in addition to ideological appeal of early Sufi masters, which making Sufism popular in some parts of the world, uh, specifically uh, I work in Bangladesh, I can, I can tell mm. Bangladesh and yeah. also Government also patronize, uh, parallel to uh, radical Islam, such as Jamaat Islam, is a big factor in Bangladesh, Pakistan, or India. So, so it is a parallel force, parallel cultural force, not political. 
So mm -hmm. as you have said, multiple uh, uh, factors are involved in the popularity. From my observation, those are some factors which are making Sufism popular nowadays in some parts of the world. Mm -hmm. That's my yeah, and, and actually, if you could uh, stick a citation of your book in the chat, I would appreciate it, because I would actually like to, to, okay. to see this if I could. Um, so please engage in some shameless self-promotion here, um, because I, I would like to have a look at that, um, in large part because uh, South Asia is obviously not my field. I'm more of a uh, uh, Turkey and Ottoman Empire specialist, so anything that I can use to fill out my knowledge there would be great. Um, but I mean, I think you're absolutely right right in making you know, a number of points here. And one is that, you know, for the ordinary Sufi follower, obviously I've sort of laid out what is, you know, in some ways predominantly an intellectual uh, framework um, for understanding how Sufism formed and developed. But, you know, the vast majority of followers don't get to this kind of level. And, uh, you know, I might as well be speaking Greek to them because they'd just be like, huh, what, you know? And so, uh, you know, for them, it's often just, you know, part of a social gathering. I mean, one of the things I found with the Sufi orders in the Ottoman Empire is that they would often found their lodges along, you know, various kinds of trunk roads traveling back and forth through the Ottoman Empire. And they actually have like basically what we would call, you know, an inn or a hotel attached to their lodge so that people could stop off there and sort of have a safe place to spend the night as they were traveling back and forth. And then people could sort of hang out in the lodge and just sort of have a social experience with other people, you know, while the Sheikh sort of, you know, uh, incorporated people into, you know, the order by various kinds of, you know, conversations and the like. And this was, you know, often, the, you know, the best way to sort of spread the order and sort of, you know, become a sort of recognized figure, you know, outside of the very local area. And as a sort of funny story, you know, when I was traveling in central Turkey once, um, you know, I knew of a famous, you know, Sufi person, and I was hoping that I might be able to find, you know, his center somewhere, because I didn't know exactly where it was. I knew it was in this town called Bolu, um, but I, I, I didn't know where it was. So I just tried jumping in a, a taxi cab and saying, you know, can you take me to, you know, the, uh, you know, the center for such and such a person. And the taxi driver's eyes kind of lit up and he was like, oh yeah, okay, I'll take you. And what I realized was that this was not somewhere in urban Bolu proper, but it was like 20 miles out of town. And I had just given him a hundred dollar fare basically to cart him all, cart myself all the way out there to this place. You know, and what I realized at that point was what this guy had done is he had an inn set up at a key pass between Istanbul and Bolu, where all the travelers were going by and stopping off at his way station. And this allowed him to sort of impart his teaching to a broad variety of people who then would spread the word about his uh, teachings all throughout this region of Turkey, both north, south, east, and west. They all passed through this sort of key nexus point. But what this tells us is that the followers were often just ordinary travelers going back and forth who probably primarily saw this as a, you know, the equivalent of the Motel 6, you know, where you could, uh, you know, have a safe place to stay and sort of, you know, be able to sort of rest and, uh, you know, recuperate before you continued further into the interior or went back to the capital or whatever. And uh, we also have records of, you know, various complaints about some of these Sufi orders that people People would gather at them just to sort of have a good time and dance around and, uh, you know, meet up with friends and things like that. And people said, well, they, people aren't there for religion. They're just there to goof off and do things that are not particularly, you know, Muslim and things like this. So I guess in the context of some of your remarks, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Thank you. And I think that at this point, especially given that we're quite advanced, advanced uh, with time, uh, I will uh, thank Professor Curry and also thank Nani uh, for helping very much with organizing this event. And I'll thank everybody for attending. Thank you and stay well and bye-bye. Goodbye, all.
Bye-bye. And thanks, Dr. Thank Khan. you.